Mr. Stein? Here. Ms. Thomas? Here. Mr. Humber? Here. Everybody here. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. Item three, approval of the minutes from June 27th. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Okay. Second. Uh, edits, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Is there anyone here who wishes to appear on an item that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, uh, we are going to go a little bit out of order. We're going to jump down to six, new business. Consideration of action on signed permit request for the Monona Grove School District offices at 5301 Monona Drive, uh, represented by Kenneth John of Two Rivers Signs. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to come up and. Yep. Yes, please. Yep. We're being uh, monitored by dozen in that uh, television audience. <laughs> no. that we, uh, <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, my name is Ken Yan from uh, Two Rivers. You're representing the Mona Grove uh, School District, and uh, Jared is also here from the school district. If you have any questions for him, uh, what we have presented to you is uh, two different signs. Um, I'll take the, the smallest sign, which is more of a directional sign that will go to in the parking lot off of Nickel Street. It's really a purpose, the only purpose is to direct people to the entrances of the district or administrative offices and the entrance to it. So when people do arrive, they come in the parking lot they know which entrance to go to. Um, I believe that uh, we're trying to keep a consistent between the two signs so the shape is very similar to the one that we're proposing on the front. And uh, again, I believe it uh, meets the specifications of the city ordinance of four foot tall and under the, uh, four foot tall and four square feet. Thank you. The, the second sign mm -hmm is the sign off uh, off of uh, Monona Drive. It's on the corner. Presently, there is an existing sign there that is, uh, Jared and I think that is somewhere over 30 years old, if not older, and it is a wood construction. But behind the wood construction is actually a steel uh, frame. And underneath that frame or underneath the sign, you'll see that there is some existing brickwork. Our goal was to incorporate the existing brickwork, use the existing steel, and uh, create a new sign to go on top of it. Again, uh, being consistent with the sign in the back, but also try to incorporate something between the, the, the new uh, street look that you have uh, done in the city of Monona, and then also try to incorporate what the school has done, blending the old school with the new addition that they put on the district, district administrative offices. So what we came up with is a design that's in front of you. Uh, we kept it at the five foot uh, height, what we're proposing is a three-dimensional type of letter that uh, at this time it will not be illuminated, it'll only be visible during the day, but we think with the ambient light from the street lights and everything else, it'll have plenty of exposure at night. And it'll be a metal constructed sign, and again with the letters pr uh, projecting out so that it'll create a three-dimensional look. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else wish to speak? We're going to, um, if you want to stay there in case uh, any of the commission members have any questions. Uh, discussion? Or it's only that one. Um, the two signs proposed meet all the requirements of the sign code, and so I've recommended approval as proposed with one condition that the landscaping shall be planted at the time of the sign's installation just to make sure that that gets done. And then just pointing out if it's still the case that the applicants wish to change the text that says administration to administrative, not having concerns with that. Just want to take a note of it. So. Um, question for you on the um, nickel side. You've got 5301 Monona Drive, even though it's not on Monona Drive. That was one of those confusing parts that we had because the physical address is still 5301 Monona Drive, even though the entrance is off of Nickel Street. So we actually came to the conclusion to leave that address on there. So if somebody uses the smartphone or something like for directional and they were 5301, they would know that they actually arrived at 5301, even though it is off Nickel Street. Other comments? Brian? Of 
eliminating the text of the address. The second, which is a bigger piece, which I was commenting earlier that this has caused more, you would think it would be fairly simple, but more discussion um, in my household lately than any sign that's been out there. Um, and it has to do with the look and the feel of the sign and the look and the feel of Nichols Building as a Manona landmark. The current sign, although it is uh, an old sign, uh, has a particular look, shape, uh, quality to it that incorporates the property as a whole uh, that gives the unique character to it. I agree that this sign meets all of the current specs. Um, I would hope to see a sign in there that would represent the current sign um, and tie together the, the landmark aspect of the property. With that said, I have a question regarding the burgundy color. If this is the same burgundy color that matches the um, the exterior on the remodel from a few years back, that was the intention. Yes. <coughs> That's my first comment, but I know others may have some. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, Kathy? I, I'm not sure I understand the concern because I don't think the sign has anything to do with the landmark status of the building. It wasn't there when the building was built. It hasn't. I mean, it's 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 not new, but it's not old, and it's not a the sign isn't a landmark. And I think that my personal view is that the current sign um, is more attractive with the building than the the, the new sign, rather than the than the current sign that's there, which is in a gray tone. So um, I I think the sign is fine. I agree with you about the fact that in the back of the building, I don't, I'm not sure why you need the address on that sign. You want to know that that's where the administrative offices are, because I think it's confusing. Do you come in the front entrance? Do you come in the back entrance? And I think having the sign is there. But I think that having the address there could be confusing and is unnecessary. So part of the, the sign um, can they have to do with some of the lettering on the south side of the building. So one of the older pieces of the building has lettering of Nickel School and um, metal on the exterior facade. This sign that's currently there has a, a tie-in and very similar connection to the building where the new proposed sign doesn't to any of the historic part of the building, but I would say with the, the coloring and some of those aspects, it does tie in with the remodel. Other comments? Yeah. I'll just, just to add to um, Commissioner Holmquist's thoughts in that typically, I don't think you were saying that the, the, the sign is a landmark. For a, a building that is a landmark, the, uh, the graphics and the branding of that building uh, reflect that landmark in the aesthetic of the sign. And so I would, would agree with Brian that well, it meets the regulations and, and it's fine. Um, I, I would argue that the aesthetics of the sign do not represent uh, a landmark piece of architecture. How would you do that? How would you represent um, the landmark? It's probably not something that I would go into here, but yes, in fact, when when you're putting signs in front of a landmark and they're going in to the Landmarks Commission and getting reviewed by communities and state and federal Landmarks Commission, then that design is to aesthetically tie in and reflect the, the architectural flavor of the building. And that can be done any number of ways. And do we think the current sign does that? Um, I don't, no, not at all. Okay. I definitely don't. Well, I would tend to agree with Brian. It may not reflect the building itself and architecture, but it, as a landmark building, it has a little more flair, for lack of a better word. But um, although it meets all the requirements, I don't know about that 
the background color being that kind of pink. I don't know what that ties into. It was an ivory color. Ivory? Okay, maybe it's the printing too. Um, I tend to like something, the, the existing sign, I actually like the, the flavor of that better than, than the proposed sign. What are the, um, Sonia, the guidelines for the commission tonight as, as far as ruling on this? Uh, the code gives six points of guidance for evaluating signs and their conformance to the sign um, code and zoning code, minimization of conflict with vehicular or pedestrian circulation, um, co compatibility with specific physical site conditions, materials and maintenance aspects, legibility and visual clarity, and then the one that is most relevant to the discussion occurring now would be compatibility <coughs> with the building characteristics adjacent uses and adjacent signs. It doesn't give any specific direction or design guidelines about how to apply that, but it lists it as an evaluation factor that can be considered. Mr. Amber. I, um, I've only been here 25 years, and I was here when we approved that sign, and we the original one, so it's something less than that, maybe 20 years or so. Uh, we did ask them to tie it into the building when, when that came before. We asked them to do that by using the same brick as whatever addition that was at that time, and that brick and cap, and that's what we felt tied it into the building. Um, I don't think the sign that's there is particularly tied into the building, nor do I think this one is. So for me, I'm, I'm good either way. I'm thankful we have the brick base with the silk cap on it, because that's what looks like the building. And, and what sign they put up there, I to me, as a matter of taste, I, I may like it, I may not. I'm not sure I can tell them not to do it because I don't like it. And as far as being a landmark, I'm not sure what our authority is under a landmark for this sign. I, that I don't know. Mr. Dorsal, any comments? Well, it seems like they've tried to utilize the, the right colors to uh, integrate in with the building. And uh, I just, I think this is within acceptable parameters. I, I don't think that it, uh, that the present sign ties in with the building any more than the, the proposed one. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, passes. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move back to item number five, unfinished business plan commission review and recommendation to city council on recodification summary by general code regarding land use legislation sections of the Monona Municipal Code of Ordinances. Sonia. <coughs> All right, so this is following up on the previous two discussions that we've had here at Plan Commission about the recodification work that we're doing for the entire Municipal Code of Ordinances. And we've gone through most of the land use and zoning sections, and there were, I believe it was four sections that remained where the Planning Commission wanted a little bit additional information. So those are summarized in the memo, and I think I'll go through um, one at a time, leaving the single family development standards for last. Okay. Um, so if we want to start with Appendix B, and that was the access management guidelines for new driveways coming onto Monona Drive in redevelopment projects. And you'll recall that the text really didn't make a lot of sense, so we had um, Public Works review it, and they shipped it over to Strand Associates, a company that we work with for consultant engineering. And Josh Straka over at Strand reviewed it and um, crossed out a few sections and looked at it just to make sure the standards were modernized and um, what remains is in the packet and that was based on his recommendation. Um, I don't have any concerns with it. It's pretty much the same guidelines that we had, but the removal of the text that didn't really seem relevant. Mm -hmm. If there were any questions? 
Mr. Armbrug. I have a couple questions. You said in the packet that we had his sheet with the cross outs. Do we have that? I, didn't. I forgot to put it in the okay, packet. That's fine. I just want to make sure I wasn't okay. the only one. Yep. Um, I have a couple of questions. Not having that, and I'm not sure where he came with some of these, but um, it's just a single page, correct? Yes. So driveways, part B, frequency, one for residential property. What about apartment building? We have apartment buildings. I know I'm going to drive that have two, and I think that's probably appropriate. In fact, it keeps them from having dead end parking. And what ties in the next thing is their driveways are less than 300 feet apart. We have very few businesses or, or users on Monroe Drive that have 300 feet of frontage. I mean, you could go to a McDonald's, Taco John's, you can go to um, that apartment building. I mean, you could go up and down Monroe Drive. There are a lot of users that have very safe situations less than 300 feet apart. So I, I think that's very restrictive for our businesses since we're stuck with what we have as far as frontages. I think that's. Um, you know, dream world to be able to have 300 foot between everyone. So I, I think we're making it a little restrictive for both of those. Um, under the width, we talk about a maximum of 30 feet, but we don't talk about, that's for medium traffic, we don't talk about high traffic. There's a lot of times where we as a commission or public works would want wider than that to provide a safer entrance and exit. One I'm thinking of is the first left in, left out off of Monona Drive is right by the dance studio and that vacant property. That was required to be a 35 foot so that there could be a little median in there so, that, so there's, there's a, a place to line them up so that they can get in there but then the people are exiting are, are shoved over so there's a, it's not in there now but that's in the, the plans whenever that gets redeveloped to have that extra little median bump in there. So in that case we want it wider than 30 feet and we don't address that in here. And then the last thing under curb radius, we do a lot of flares too. And a flare is actually more effective than a radius because a radius, you look at them, some lines are always cutting over that radius. There's always a straight line where, where the grass or the landscape is completely ruined, where most municipalities now put in flares more often than radiuses. So I would think under that section, we would allow flares. Other comments? How would you, uh, I mean, it, Mr. Amberg, with the, uh, you, were, you were thinking of Monona Drive, but that was unique because we were reconstructing existing. Would this, um, be, would the guidelines that are here be more appropriate for anything new that would come along? If you're talking about Broadway, we certainly have larger frontages, but even some of the most recent proposals we've had come before us have had driveway accesses closer than 300 feet, for example. And it's wholly appropriate. I mean, what we have to look at is, is where are the cuts, what's going on on Broadway. We have a median there, so if we give an additional cut, most often it's a right in, right out. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty safe situation. It just helps traffic flow within the site. Uh, I'm thinking about Monona Drive because these were originally in Monona Drive access guidelines, and they still will, will cover Monona Drive. And, and I guess one thing is I'd have a question is they always were guidelines. It wasn't ordinance. We put this into our ordinance. This is now ordinance versus a guideline, and we're changing the whole nature of what we crafted. And is that what we want to do, or do we want to leave them as guidelines? Commission members, thoughts? Can we, Brian, can we get clarity on the ability to reference the appendix as guidelines versus ordinance? I think so I, I I generally believe that guidelines are better because you, the minute you put it in an ordinance you run into a situation where you have a unique situation you got an ordinance and either you can't do anything about it or you have to go to the zoning board of appeals so the question really is if it's a guideline are they required to get approval to have this done and come before the plan commission and then it is up to the good judgment and discretion of the plan commission on whether or not to allow it or to not allow it that to me for as long as i have been around has worked really well because this is a really smart group of people who's who has differences but balances them out in a very sensible way and i think generally speaking we end up with a better product than we started out with. So I personally like the idea of guidelines if they have to come in under all circumstances to have this done. Does that make sense to you, Chris? 
I would prefer them as guidelines. The, the one hiccup we'll have is, is anybody that needs a zoning permit has to come before this body, so we have an ability to look at it. But if somebody comes for a driveway permit, for example, and it's just handled through through staff, say, for they approve a driveway permit, you know, at that point in time, do they follow the guidelines? What do they do? It's a, it's a judgment call. And maybe that's what we're looking to get with this. I don't know. But I, I'm comfortable with how we've handled the past when people come here. I, but if we're giving guidelines, I'd like to give guidelines that we're, we're expecting versus a 300 foot. The example I use in McDonald's is much safer with the two cuts and a one way in and a one way out. It's a much safer traffic circulation there than if we, I don't know how you'd restrict a user like that to one driveway cut. And the apartment building is much safer because they don't have a dead end when they have the one in and the one back out on one on a drive. And that, I don't think that can be more than 150 feet apart. So it's, it's hard to come up with something here and say this is what it's going to be and that's our, our ordinance for me. How would you modify what's before us today? Well, I, I guess the first thing I would do is, is get consensus amongst the commission whether they should be guidelines or ordinance and then what our recommendation to the council will be on that. And depending on what they are, I think would change how we look at it. Certainly for the frequency, one cut per residential property, if it's a single family, that would be wholly appropriate. But we don't have any U-shaped driveways in town? We do. I, I'm, we probably do. I'm not sure. I'm not recalling one on Monona Drive. On Mono, on, I, and I'm not, I thought you were talking about single family. I want to have one, but I said single family. Yeah. Yeah. There's single family on Monona Drive. Oh, and, and, and perhaps there could be a case, you're right, there could be a case where a U-shaped drive, they pull in and pull straight out and they'll have to back on a Monona Drive. That might be more effective. I, I, you know, that's, that's a great example of we don't know. When we do this, we have all the unintended consequences always. So. I think that's a hard one. I, I'm not sure what the distance should be for two. I, I think there has to be some discretion there. Uh, it depends on the use and what they're proposing. And as far as the uh, width, it's another one. Uh, if it's at least with a high traffic generator, we could have that category. We have low traffic generator, medium, we don't even have a high traffic generator. And I'm not sure about the vehicle per day counts. I'm not sure how they correlate to a fast food server, for example. Although the one I'm talking about down on Manoa Drive, that's not a fast food server. It's just a con when we when we rebuilt Manoa Drive, we consolidated so many cuts. Mm -hmm. We created this. What's what we want? But we have more traffic there, and we need to control that traffic better. There's a lot of cases where we like to have a little median in there to separate the incoming and outgoing, or ingress and egress, or whatever you want to call it. And that's handy. That's something we actually want. And if this were an ordinance, it wouldn't allow it. Yeah. I think to expand on the examples that have been given that that uh, would encourage us to be guidelines is is the um, property on Monona Drive that the city is looking to have redeveloped and in particular blocks across from the high school um, you know there's no way to, to, to put in an ordinance that would even begin to address what may or may not go in those blocks over there. So as, as guidelines, it will give us the flexibility to, to work with that redevelopment. So, so if we rec recommend that these be considered guidelines and not incorporated in the ordinance, would you want to add something regarding the flare versus radius? Absolutely. What, how would you word that? Just per radius or flare, 15 foot medium, 15 foot minimum and 20 foot desirable. Uh, the flares are much more effective for keeping the landscape in uh, As far as the two per commercial frontage of greater than 300 feet, I'm, uh, I'd put in maybe two per commercial on a, I don't know, how, how do you put on a, I don't want to say as needed basis, but for commercial may be evaluated or may, As may be allowed if appropriate or, or something like that, but they're guidelines. Chris, I, I presume a, a flare is a straight, yeah, straight flare line is cut, right? Yeah, the radius, the flare is just a yeah. straight line from the radius point to what would sure. be the radius point to radius point. But what that does, if you look when they come across that radius, the semi's always cut in that corner. And we used to spend well, the all semis and, and me. Oh, it's all yeah. kind of cars. <laughs> Exactly, if you have a real narrow one. When we first crafted the Monona Drive guidelines, and you have to remember the genesis of this. This was because we had, I mean, solid curb cuts up and down Monona Drive. We said, this has to stop. We have to put something out here that we have some authority to say, hey, you can't keep putting all these curb cuts in. I mean, it was a, it was 
I don't know what to compare it to. Was, there's more curb cuts than curb. And, and so when we did it, we, I think we overreacted. And what we did, we set up maximum of 24 feet except for special users. And what we found pretty soon was cars couldn't get off and don't drive quick enough because we made it too narrow. Somebody didn't mm -hmm. hug right over to that right side. They were blocking the driveway. And the car would be seen on the middle driveway had rear index. So said, whoa, wait, that's probably not the best. Maybe we better relax this a little bit because most of our users are commercial. And so by widening these out or restricting the width, it's like sometimes that's not what we want. With a bike path there now, it's a little easier to make that swing in. But it's still, if you have 24 feet and somebody's not paying attention, they get a little towards that middle, it gets really hard to make that turn in, which is why we want the larger flare radius where we can. So we crafted them to cut down on curb cuts. We realized we tightened it up too much. We relaxed it a little bit. And we certainly want to have it because we don't want to have the same situation we had before. We want to have some guidelines, but we want to have some discretion, I think, I guess is what I'm saying. Kathy? Yeah, I think the difference is if this were new if this were new development, you'd want to have ordinances that had very rigid kinds of things. But whenever as as we know, whenever we're dealing with, with redevelopment, there are unique situations and they need to be reviewed um, one on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so thus the case, I think, for the guideline approach. So it, would everything, if it were a very, if somebody wanted to propose something that's different than what uh, these guidelines represent, would they come to Zoning Board of Appeals or come to this body? This, this group. Do we say that on this document? That any any variance from these um, guidelines would require plan commission. Well, it approval. should be that, but only. I mean, ZBA is ordinance exceptions so to the ordinance. So, if this were guideline, it wouldn't have to go there. No. Do we want to even say that this make that comment that it comes? Well, people plan? need to know if they're going to do it. I mean, I suppose they could go to Sonia, but yeah, I think you you I think you ask the council to empower this body to review and approve and make the decision on it. Which we've been doing for the last how many years? 295. 35, <laughs> and I'm aware of, or 25, I mean, probably, how long I, have you been here? We've always made those decisions. So how would you change um, uh, B2? Well, I, I'd start with B1, and I would say, I don't even know if I'd distinguish them between residential and commercial. Maybe one per low volume property and then two per medium to high volume properties when deemed appropriate uh, or something along those lines. How Are do we, you define low volume? Right. Well, they have it defined later. They have but residential at 750 vehicles per day down below. So it's kind of by default a definition on it. But I don't know how many vehicles per day come out of that apartment complex. Probably not a lot. What is that, 20, 24 units? Fairway Glen. No, 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 no. I'm thinking the one that's um, on the side by, by uh, Super America. And it has used to have two cuts on one on a drive. Now it comes out the other way. But I'm sure we have other properties the like that. The old car property. Thing. No, up from the old car. Carl has one. That, that thing goes behind Across Super America. Across from Insty Prince? Kind of, yeah. It's right next door. So. Uh, but but the, the fact is somebody else could do it. A, a Fairway Glen could come in and reasonably asked for two driveway cuts for, for something like that, if it made sense. Again, they have to have a, most of the people that come for this have to have a zoning permit. So mm -hmm. it's one of the things, among all the things we review, that's one of the things we look at. And, and I think we kind of get it, but we're trying to put it in words and, and make it work and give people guidance without tying their hands or our hands. That's a difficult thing, but. What, what if one, what if B1 said, uh, instead of per residential property, per uh, single family? Properties. So, are we talking about no, 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 drive this. No, bro. It has some right by the M and I Bank. Uh, Marion Litchfield single family. No, no, she's not. She's multi. It's a single family. It's residential property. You say one per single family residential property. Uh, none of it's zoned. I, I don't think zoning any of it's zoned that way anymore. We have it all zoned to redevelop, correct? Right. None of nothing's zoned single family. But there are still single families, and and and. The whole point is to say, well, you know, you don't really need two driveways out there on the own drive. And I think that's a reasonable thing to say in most cases. So would single family residential property solve that? 
Should we say all properties? Well, single family residential property might solve that. One yeah. cut per single family. And then uh, the two per commercial period? Yeah. as reasonable or something I mean uh, we still need the ability it for a, a may be considered may be considered I like that because our goal I, don't get away from our goal our goal is to consolidate dry weight cuts our goal is to get the businesses to have them all together we did a really good job of that we rebuilt Monona Drive which takes a lot of this away because if I'm a small business I buy a spot and I don't have a medium break I'm going to try to work with my neighbor to get over there to the medium break I'm not going to try just to have a right in right out that's that's a killer so Brian, sorry. What if underneath the frequency that um, it just started off with the number three becoming the number one, that consolidation access when our properties are assembled underneath one purpose or some idea of the intended purpose is to yeah. decrease the frequency and consolidation? Any, any additional curb cuts for a property to be considered as reviewed by the Planning Commission? Sure. And eliminate the, is it residential, is it multifamily, is it commercial? Just let it be a reviewed item. Say that again. So underneath frequency, you get rid of all the one, two, threes, and fours, and have a statement that indicates consolidation access whenever properties are assembled underneath one purpose. Additional curb cuts um, would be considered on an individual basis. Everybody okay with that? Down on the bottom, we're going to change uh, curb radius to uh, curb radius or flare. Correct. Yes. Everybody okay with that recommendation? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. We're moving on. And First. then under width, the high volume. Yeah. You know, for for high vol high vol I'm having a problem talking tonight. <laughs> for high volume users, uh, planning commission may consider greater widths. <coughs> we we. You say consider we we may require it for certain users. Number one, we'll put semi turning radiuses and fire truck turning radiuses on to make sure they can make it. And if they can't, we might require it wider just for that. So Brian, how would you modify D? Um, D three might be additional width uh, would be authorized. So that one would stay the same. I would add a number four. It talks about high volume uh, generator, and my guess is there's a anything above 1,500 vehicles per day unit, as well as through turn radius analysis, additional width might be required. Well, like high volume and special considerations. I have a question. Yep. So when we talk about these 750 to 1,500 vehicles per day. We require them to do some sort of traffic study to prove this, or who's there's, responsible there's, no, for this? There's books you can look up for this type of a use, what you expect for a typical traffic generation. I mean, that's a real easy figure to get. You know, somebody comes in here and says, yeah, honestly, I don't see us telling people they have too wide of a driveway most times, because most times we want to get those cars off and on and drive as smoothly with as little conflict as possible. One more time, D. What's the added line or the item number four we're looking at? Uh, Chris, you had it best last. Really? Yeah. Did you do that? Throw it back at me. <laughs> for, for, it was high volume and special something. It was uh, high volume. And high volume and special considerations. May require additional. I'd start it consistent with I'm three, cryptic. so additional width may be required for uh, construction involving high volume and whatever else was just special circumstances. So just modify three. May be required, um, so may be allowed. Four, but I would just keep the same sentence structure, so it would say additional width may be required for. Allowed. I'm would you say allowed or required? Oh. Let's let's Review. stay required because that implies that that has to that somebody is telling him that it's needed. Yeah. Required. Maybe we want to say both allowed or required. I don't know. Because you're right; they may ask for it. Who's going to require it is the question. Us. Us. I, here, us. For um, high, maybe required for. 
could be allowed or ask us for it. Sonia, what do you think we were trying to get at here? What if you, what are you frantically <laughs> reading down? I'm writing down all the different iterations here. Um, yes, you asked my opinion. I think that these have always been guidelines. Um, every redevelopment project that comes to the plan commission is reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis anyway. So I don't really think that we're changing anything with regards to whether it's a requirement or a guideline. It's just always a guideline. we are cleaning up um, what the reasonable guideline is. So I'm OK yes. with that. You could actually leave it as three, where it says additional with authorized if access is combined by two or more properties, comma, or um, construction produces high traffic volume or other circumstances. I mean, you could, add it all, you could tack it all into number three if you want. Mm -hmm. um, also, in the landscaping standards of the code, which are under Appendix A. It has language like adjustments to these standards may be authorized by the Plan Commission upon demonstration of due cause by the Plan Commission. That sounded pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> sure, so let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> demonstration of due cause by the applicant. That's right. <laughs> Sonia, are you comfortable with this, or do you got it? Um, I just need clarification on exactly what we're changing. So should I change, um, first of all, number one under E should be curb or flare radius. Cur no, curb radius or flare. Curb radius. Yeah, radius or flare. Mm -hmm. Or flare. OK, we all agree on that one. Mm -hmm. um, under B for frequency, it should be number one, one per residential property, period. Number two. No, no. We got one and two are, are deleted. Gone. Those are gone. One, two, and four are gone. Okay. One, two, and four under frequency are gone, and we're keeping number three consolidate access whenever properties are assembled under one purpose. No, I thought, no, no, I thought we were. Well, then we were going to add on to that one. Brian, I'm throwing it back at you. You said <laughs> this. <laughs> um, we kept three and four. I thought you had something you had for one, too. I'm just low yeah. volume versus Yeah, it was the a statement about consolidated access whenever properties are assembled underneath one purpose. And additional um, cuts would be warranted based on individual purpose. Going back to the previous Appendix A that you were talking about with the better language than we're mm -hmm. giving you right now, that idea. OK. So so B frequency would would read number one, consolidate access whenever properties are assembled under one purpose. And two would be adjustments to these guidelines may be authorized by the plan commission upon demonstration of due costs by the applicants. Yep. Perfect. Everybody's nodding heads. No. no. Uh, I would say consolidate access as reasonable whenever properties are assembled. What if we, they consolidate a property? They only have two for the whole block. We, we're not going to tell them they have to consolidate those two to one. So it, it still has to come back to reasonableness. How, how many cuts are on that block you talked about across from the high school? Zero? Zero now. You're, you're having a heck of a time consolidating that. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I'm just saying. I mean, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not trying to be difficult, but uh, again, consolidate whenever reasonable or as reasonable whenever properties are assembled. That was always our goal. Th this was written when we had all those curb cuts. We didn't have joint access. We hadn't forced all the joint access in with Mono Drive. We don't have a lot of that issue anymore. Consolidated access is encouraged whenever properties are assembled. Yes, absolutely. Are assembled as opposed to you have to. You're right. She is a good writer. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's. Okay, Sonia, so. Go through frequency again. Frequency, sub one, consolidated access is encouraged whenever properties are assembled under one purpose. And two, um, adjustments to minimum standards, minimum guidelines may be authorized by the plan commission upon demonstration of due cause by the applicants. How can we have adjustment to minimum standards when we don't talk about what the minimum standard is? Because you cut out. The two minimum standard of water. That doesn't work. 
We still then have to have one original one and two we have to talk about. All drives reviewed by planning commission. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just saying, you yeah. know, no, you're right. we're going to have the same thing. We're going to be right. Multiple driveways may be considered. More than one driveway may be considered. More than one driveway requires review by the planning commission. Yeah. The circumstances require. Yeah. More than, More than one, one driveway, one driveway requires. requires review from the planning commission. But yeah, that's might be the best way to say. I like that. Do you need another pad of paper? <laughs> I would say don't we have to allow we have to allow people access to a public highway or public right away with the front on any kind of state code we can we can't tell them they can't have it we can encourage them to go sideways but by law I believe they have the rights to access yeah, because you Sonia, you're, the you're right. we've created mm -hmm. it sideways or straight on sometimes we've still created that access <laughs> Why wouldn't you make it for all drivers? Okay, let's. I, don't know. I, I mean, if they're going to consolidate or do that stuff, I mean, maybe they want to do one, and maybe we think it's not a safe condition underneath, or we don't like the location. What? How about um, frequency sub one consolidated access is encouraged whenever properties are assembled under one purpose? Frequency sub two. More than one driveway may be authorized by the plan commission. Or required. <laughs> Maybe may authorized or required. Okay. So are, are we are we saying? I mean, I'm thinking that any driveway change <coughs> should come because maybe they're going to put one driveway in and we don't like where we're, we don't think it is logical where they're going to put it. Right, every single driveway, even if it's one or zero, is has to, to come the before the plan commission. No. I, I think if it's a, if there was, if someone wanted to do a, a new curb cut or move the driveway, I would bring it to plan commission. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be devil's advocate. Let's say the old quick loop next to Devonish's old building where Food Fight is. They used to have a curb cut pretty close to the side street, and they say, well, we're going to put the new one, and we want to get away from that side street, so we're going to move it way away, and that's all they're doing the whole property. There'd have to be blacktop there, I understand, but let's just say they're making it a safer thing, then we're going to make them come to the planning commission to do that? Or well, but what if they're not going to make it a safer thing? What if all they're doing is they're moving their driveway further away from the intersection. It doesn't cost them anything to come here except they get to see us. What if they were in the middle and they were going to move it over closer to the street? That would be a problem. And so how would we know that unless they came here? We have fabulous staff. <laughs> but she can't <laughs> arbitrarily decide which ones okay. come here. I, I don't think. I think you're. I think we're yeah we're that's more the exception and I think the the rule would. What what um. Is there anything else, Sonia, on here? We've done the floor. We've done width. We've got language for that. <clears throat> Under width, we would retain one, two, and. I believe we were talking about um, keeping number three mm -hmm. and adding additional width <coughs> authorized or required for high traffic generators or under special circumstances. Okay. We are going to be moving on to earth station dish antennas. Doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> So, so you want to take us, and then, then we're going to get to Alder O'Connor's uh, appearance. Okay. Um, under Earth Station dish antennas, in the memo I summarized where we left off last time, and at that time, um, Sydney had done some research and found that the average of any of communities, the 108 communities she reviewed, they had an average diameter allowance of 11 feet. Ours was nine. So I recommended retaining that, and then the conversation turned to, well, do we really want to encourage that type of um, structure in residential neighborhoods um, that seems too large? So we talked about prohibiting um, those larger dishes in residential neighborhoods. Um, and <clears throat> so the recommended ordinance revisions were reviewed by the attorney, and I summarized uh, what the revisions do. So number one, it prohibits any type of earth station dish antenna in residential districts that includes a building mounted or a ground mounted unless it's under two feet in diameter. Uh, 
or unless it existed prior to the adoption of this code, in which case it would be grandfathered. I'm not aware of any structures in Monona that would fall under that grandfather consideration. Um, and we cannot regulate anything under the two feet in diameter under state law. And um, in our research, we found that modern cable TV dishes are generally around 18 inches in diameter. Okay. Um, number two, uh, the ordinance changes. Again, that's just stating we added the language that says we cannot regulate dishes under two feet in diameter, regardless of the zoning district. And then number three, does allow earth station dish antennas in commercial, industrial, public or institutional districts only after review of a zoning permit by the plan commission, um, as we usually do for new structures in those districts and with the standards that are listed in the ordinance for things like height uh, requirements for screening and setbacks. And we decided to retain this allowance for those districts after discussion with the city attorney, um, talking about how um, prohibiting them in residential districts is a reasonable regulation for aesthetic concerns, um, but that they do have common uses for broadcasting, satellite telemetry, and other things, and may be appropriate for some commercial and institutional or industrial properties. And so it was reasonable to um, allow for them with limitations. On the H at the $25 fee, weren't we coming up with a schedule of fees that we, we could reference yep. rather than having it buried in here? Mm -hmm. So it can we should cross that out. Cross that out and cross reference the schedule of fees. Mm -hmm. So the fees can be updated and we don't have to go in and change the ordinance. Okay. Any other comments? Chris? I have one more if I could just add okay. yep. Chris. Um, the city attorney added one clarification under section B uh, and it is um, reading through addition antennas are permitted in the side and rear yards and commercial industrial uh, the next sentence is ground mounted earth station dish antennas shall meet all setback yard requirements for accessory structures in the zoning district in which they are located. And then for the last sentence in subsection B, he recommended adding ground mounted dish antennas must be located at least five feet from any principal structure. Um, just clarifying that so that you don't unintentionally, unintentionally effectively prohibit um, a uh, ground mounted because the setback would not apply to a building mounted structure. So you, we, he wanted to clarify that the setback requirement only applies to the ground mounted structure so that we're not confusing that with a building mounted. Okay. Chris? Does it say that we allow building mounted uh, dishes? Because it doesn't really all, it says there are dish antenna, uh, antennas, I told you I can't talk, are permitted in the, in the side and rear yards in commercial, industrial, and public upon approval. It doesn't talk about that are allowed on a building. That's where a lot of people put them. Um, and then when we get to that 10 foot side yard that he recommended, our, our accessory structure ordinance is, I think, three foot. And a lot of these, when they do go in, if anybody would put one in, they usually go in their green space. They don't go in the parking lot. And usually they don't have a lot more than 10, 12 feet between their, their pavement and the adjacent property. So I think we could create an issue with that 10 feet. And I'm not sure where we allow them on the building, the way it's written. And then if we do, and we call for screening for HVAC on a rooftop, what do we think about a 12 foot or nine foot dish on a rooftop? Well, we're, we're getting not even talking about or addressing it. We're, we're not doing the nine foot. That's what this is. That's what this, this would is allow, this would prohibit anything above two feet in diameter in residential districts, but allow um, up to nine feet diameter in commercial, industrial, public institutional. Okay. Everybody, everybody like that? Well, I, Brian? I like the concept of the two foot or below in the residential, but I think Chris has pointed out is in commercial. Let's just, we'll pick on Dale. <laughs> he wants to put a nine foot dish on top of his building. Does this say that he can put it on the building right now? It says he has to put it in the yard. He doesn't have really much of a yard over there. And if he does, does he have the appropriate setbacks to make it work? Could if we have him put it on the roof, it, if we want to screen it? If we, if we reduced it to two feet and somebody had a, a commercial user had a use, 
that they absolutely needed a larger dish, they could go to ZBA and, and get a variance, correct? What do we want this? Do we want them to just automatically be able to put in a nine foot dish on the top of their building without any? Well, I thought our last discussion was no, we didn't want them. Yeah, to I agree. Uh, if they do, I think we'd certainly want to talk about the aesthetics or what it does to the building. I, I mean, that's. That, let, let's. Do people want nine foot dishes, Kathy? Well, if it's out in the by Walmart yeah. in that district, and there are worse things out there than nine foot disc right now, in my opinion. And if it's a business that comes in that's going to develop something that we, I mean, that they need to do their business, of course, if if it's a new business, then they'd have to come before us and they could ask for it as part of their approval for um, for their locating there or for changing. And so out there, do I have a problem with it? No. Do I have a pro would I have concerns on Monona Drive? Yeah, I would. I mean, if it's not concealed. So it depends upon where it is and what it's for and whether they really want it or whether they just want to be a ham radio operator in their spare time. So what would be the problem if um, it were two feet, anything over that, they'd have to go to ZBA because they need it? Why would, if they're a new <coughs> business, why wouldn't it be part of the approval as part of the plan commission approval? Okay. Yeah, ZBA would apply for variances in single family and two family districts. All other conditional use permits or deviations from these standards would come to plan commission. So then if it's over two feet, they have to come here to get approval and we could grant it? Yeah. So. We want to. Do we want to change yeah, and this? As to well as applying conditions of approval. I understand. So, do we want this to be allow nine? Continue to allow nine foot, or do we want this to um, start at two feet? Brian, Sonny, can you remind us of what all the information gathering is suggesting in reference to the two foot and nine foot of what we're allowed to regulate versus not? Uh, the city cannot regulate anything two feet in diameter or less, okay. regardless of the zoning district. Those have to be permitted. Anything Other above, that's... we can restrict completely um, or limit. And the research um, showed that most communities either don't have, of the 108 that we looked at, they don't either have a limit at all or their limit averages around 11 feet in diameter. Ours was nine. So why don't we just say if in a commercial district someone wants to put um, a dish in that is in excess of two feet that they need to come to the plan commission for approval and conditions of, as well as conditions of approval. How does everybody feel about that? I think that makes sense. Yeah. Good? Yeah. So anything over two feet? Anything over two feet they come here for? Yep. And it's only in, it's only allowed in commercial districts, right? We, well, we have. Let's let her write. Non, not in non-residential. How's that? Anything over two feet. Yeah. So any dish over two feet in diameter in the commercial, industrial, and public institutional zoning districts must receive approval of a conditional use permit by the planning commission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be much. It, like, he's, like the attorney said, heavy cement needs telemetry or something. It's outdated technology. Uh, Edward Jones on the drive has one sitting there. They want somebody to take down or please take away. They don't, they don't use it. They invest thousands of dollars, and now they have no use for it because it is truly outdated for what they do. But uh, I don't know. There could be some high-tech company that needs it. In that yeah. case, let's let them come. Yeah, doesn't the university have some high-tech Dishes that it tracks satellites. I mean, maybe uh, we'd get like one of those. Broadcasting. They use so, it. so I mean, so let them come here, and if we're anxious right. to have them, then we say. Any any other comments on the Earth Station dish antennas? So, so I'll here. just summarize what would be left in this section. So we would keep A, which is. Ground-mounted earth station dish and building-mounted earth station dish antennas are prohibited in, re in residential districts. We would keep I, which is any earth station dish antenna existing on the date of adoption of the section which is not conform to these regulations shall be treated in accordance with Article G of this chapter. That is the non-conforming 
okay. legal structures. Um, we would keep J, which is these requirements shall not apply to an earth station dish two feet in diameter or less. And then the last section would be any dish over two feet in diameter in the commercial, industrial, public institutional zoning districts shall receive approval of a conditional use permit by the planning commission. Wonderful. Could, could I Chris? add one suggestion? Um, it might be redundant, but that A, it said this the ground mounted first station dish and building or blah, 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 are prohibited in residential areas. Why don't we say over two feet are prohibited in residential areas? Because that's what we're trying to say in this first sentence you read in this entire section. Why Under two feet are permitted in residential. It's, we're on prohibited. It depends on your word. Oh, right? prohibited. 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 So over two, two feet, feet are prohibited in residential, and that's done then. And then in commercial, it's just going to come, anything over two feet in commercial is going to come to us for approval. Okay. But first sentence you read in this section is what you stick with. Right. Okay. Um, we're going to move on. And Alder Mary O'Connor, 5103 Winnicott Road, would like to speak in favor of the single family residential development standards. Welcome, Mary. <laughs> Good evening. I'm going to make this just short. Uh, <laughs> I know Kathy hopes it's long, but no, we're already over the time. I've already won. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Um, just for the partly for the purpose of uh, a couple of you weren't here last time, so I just wanted to give just a brief uh, little reiteration of what I spoke about um, back in June. Since I've been elected to council, I've heard a l from a lot of people being concerned about uh, situations where new homes are being built in their neighborhoods that seem way out of proportion to what's in the surrounding area. And, and I realize that we can't, I don't think we can get into the business of judging what is or isn't characteristic of a, neighborhood, of a neighborhood, it's so subjective. I'm not exactly sure how you do that. But I am concerned about there's been at least a couple of cases where a lot of dirt has been brought in and then houses to really raise the grade and then a house built on top of that. And I, I think Sonia put some examples in the packet. Um, and consequently, the neighbors on either side are, you know, either they don't have any light at all or it's, it's just kind of overwhelming. And I know that we have a, a uh, there's something in the ordinances in the code about um, the height of maximum height can be 35 feet, but we don't really make an allowance for building up the lot several feet before we start measuring the 35 feet. And I'm wondering if something could be done uh, to control raising, I guess it's essentially raising the grade, isn't it? And I realize there's cases where people maybe want to put in a full basement and have to do that, but it just seems like there should be some sort of control over how that can be done. Uh, the other issue is the amount of concrete that's being put in um, driveways. There are some, a couple of places where like the whole front yard is, is paved. And I know that we've spent a lot of time trying to prevent stormwater runoff from going into the lake. And it seems like we don't really, I'm not real clear at something that uh, was in the packet this time, if there is any actual limitation on how much concrete or impermeable surface can be on a property is is it's is 30 feet a, did you find is a guideline but it isn't always I can clarify that I followed up on um, so I know it's 40 per, the building it's the structure itself isn't supposed to take up more than 40 percent but that does not include any concrete so I'm wondering if there can be something done about allowing for Im, you know more permeable surfaces or the amount of restricting the amount of impermeable pavement or whatever. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Sonia. Okay, so I put a lot of information together in here um, to just help us in our conversation. Um, part of it was intended to help us really identify what the issue is because I think there are a lot of different things as Mary was pointing out. One, there's the impervious surface. One, there's the raising of the grade, changing existing natural character. There were also concerns mentioned just about the building itself seeming out of character. And I was thinking about is that in relation to architectural um, design issues or is it a factor of the mass and the intensity? Um, for the neighborhood? Is it because it's incompatible with the properties next to it? So all these different things, I was still not exactly clear what issue we're trying to address. And a number of the solutions in here can go to different problems. So um, 
that's kind of listed out some of the issues. You know, what are we trying to achieve? Similar architecture, similar landscape to house ratios, preservation of lake views, reduction of stormwater runoff, et cetera. Um, and then the possible options for discussion that could be solutions. I wonder, um, should I just kind of run through those? Um, I provided some examples and just let you know it was a teardown or new construction or previously or, or redeveloped. Um, in some cases, I identified that the um, assessed value would increase a lot, which contributes to the tax base. Um, considerations of these larger homes being more attractive to young families moving into the neighborhood. People want modernized homes, so those are some of the reasons why um, we don't want to discourage this type of remodeling. Um, so on page five of the memo, I have two separate tables. In one, I sort of listed the simple um, ordinance revisions that we could do, or on the back side, just for discussion, nothing I'm recommending, but the complicated things that would start to address those architectural concerns. So under the simple table, um, if we just want to continue to allow people to re, um, redevelop homes in accordance with the existing zoning standards, then don't change anything. Um, second is clarify height definition. Ours is pretty consistent with other communities, and I don't think that height of the structure itself is the issue. It sounds like it really is if the grade is changed first and then the home is built on top of that. So it might be more an issue of um, boxes, box number four, um, detailing a requirement for a grading plan rather than changing the height of the structure that would be allowed. Um, Number three, something that might help is to clarify, um, first define lot coverage and clarify what kind of impervious surface is allowed. So right now lot coverage in the code just says 40%, um, but it doesn't define it. So we've interpreted that over time to mean 40% of the lot may be covered by structures. We don't have a limitation in the single family zoning district um, for impervious surface. Um, what Mary was referring to was the 30% um, rule that I cited coming from Appendix A of the zoning code, and we've typically applied that in plan commission review to redevelopment projects in the commercial districts. So we've required that all sites shall generally be required to have up to 30% green space. So if that's a benchmark in any way, we could use that to also talk about residential properties. Um, we could add an impervious surface maximum. Sydney reviewed a lot of other communities again, and um, some of them include an impervious surface maximum, and it looks like most of them are at 60 to 65%. Uh, we could allow up to 70%, which would then retain that 30% in green space. Um, my interpretation of having a 60% impervious maximum means that you could cover 40% of the lot with structures, footprints, of buildings and then an additional 20% of the lot could be covered in paved surface. So you would get to a total of 60% previous surface, which would leave 40% green space. So that's just an option of how we could apply that. Whether that addresses the problem or not, I'm not <coughs> sure um, because I don't think it that gets at um, the mass of the building or the height above grade, um, but it does maybe clarify something else that we've been lacking. Um, and then finally, detail requirements for a grading plan. The building inspector uh, did think that this might be a good solution, but um, difficult to implement. We'd have to review the details. Uh, we're having additional requirements for uh, property owners that want to come in and redevelop their homes. But there are good examples. Sydney found this one from New Berlin, where it talks about um, you know, it's a, a two, two pages of detailed requirements so that the building inspector would be able to apply it himself rather than come to committees. And it includes things like no lot or portion of a lot or parcel shall be excavated, graded, or filled without approval as required by this chapter. Um, building grades shall be compatible with the average grade of adjacent buildings and sites. All grades shall be compatible with proposed landscaping drainage requirements. Altered topography shall be integrated with existing and surrounding topography. And there are other things in there that we could review. Um, those are kind of the only things that I had under simple. If you want me to quickly go over complicated <laughs> before we discuss. Yeah. OK. Yeah. 
So under complicated, this gets into more, if the issue really is the mass and the character of the home, what are some things that communities do to address that? One, you could better define community character. Uh, I think that's really difficult. It can be very subjective, um, and it would require some sort of review board to determine if it really met that definition of community character, which leads to number two, establish some sort of architectural review board. I don't think we have the staff capacity to have a committee like that. It's another hoop uh, that single family property owners would need to jump through. I think it would be very difficult to administer. Um, but there are things out there like that if communities want to enforce very strict design standards. Again, is that really getting at the issue? I don't think so, because I don't think the goal here is to have more similar architecture. Um, it's more about um, possibly the height above altered grade or the mass of the structure. Jesse? Um, th this is, uh, I think, it, because of the topography in Monona, it's a, it's a real challenge, and I'm going to give you some examples. Um, I commend people in Belle Isle who raise their properties up and don't flood. So you have to deal with that. Um, I'll take my property, for example. Um, I have three stories on the back side, two stories on the front side. What's the mean level? And I will tell you that I don't have a huge roof, but I, my neighbors, my two neighbors, to the south of me, none of us contribute any runoff from our roofs because the water runs down in that runs down through the house underground. I mean, it was built in 1930, and I don't know how they did it. And so I think there are things that you can do to control, to, to take measures to prevent runoff, if that's what we're concerned about the pervious surface. The other thing is, I like. I mean, I. I, I don't know where the standards of the houses on the Gander properties on Femright are as to the as to how much they take up of the property, but I think that kind of development is totally appropriate. And we run into when we talk about how much we cover with land. You know, if we don't build here, they're going to go out between here and Cottage Grove and build, and it's going to be then require more sewer system and spreading the septic system. So how do we, the 5% the or whatever that are the problems that, that really make our community look not very attractive and create a very unpleasant atmosphere, how do we deal with that 5% and, and not punish the other 95% who are going to do developments? And I have no answer. I just think that in, in adopting standards, we have to be very cautious because my experience over the years is for everything we say, that for every action we take that does something good, it creates a consequence over here. And if there is, if we're going to put stricter standards in, I think, again, they can go to, I assume they could go to the ZBA if it's an ordinance. We're talking about ordinance changes here. We're talking about guide, guidelines. How will we monitor? Um, because we don't want to discourage additional development. We just want it to be responsible. And I have, I have lots of questions and no answers. Mr. Armour. How many new homes do we have in Monona in any given year? What's the average over the last five, 10 years? New, new or? New homes. Or remodeled, expanded? New homes. No, new homes. Tear down new construction. Yeah, because most of our issues are coming with the new homes. When they're remodeling, they're stuck with the grade they have. They're stuck with the topography. In most cases, it's really difficult for them to change much with a remodel. It's really the ones I see, and I don't know about you, but the ones I see have been the new ones. So how many new ones do we have in a year? On average, it's less than five. I think we have going to say, I, I'm guessing it's like that. And I'm not bucking for more work, but I thought about it a lot after your last presentation, and the body that really has the most experience reviewing these plans, reviewing grades, aesthetics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's probably why you came here. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's probably us, and, and the reason I say that is ZBA, I mentioned it last time, that is a tough nut there. You, you have to show a legal hardship to, to get a variance there, and I don't think we want to put people under that kind of oversight or pressure. If there's less than five a year, it'd be nice to know. If there's less than five a year, do we tell them they have to come for review? I, 
one of the things I look at when I, when I do this, I think I can think of one that wasn't, but most of the ones where they really messed up their neighbors with drainage is because they're trying to circumvent our 36 foot or 35 foot maximum height. So why do we have that? If that's just going to mess them up, is that an issue? Or should we have that limit? Normally it's because of stick frame construction, the building techniques, but they've changed a lot in the last 30, 40, 50 years since we had that standard. I don't know the answer, but it's a good question. If all they're doing is circumventing that 35 feet, we're making a mess because of that, because the host didn't change. And, and we can control drainage. I mean, we're really good at that at this at this level. We look at plans, we decide about drainage, and most of the time when they do that, they make a mess of their neighbor. Because what happens is there's drainage supposed to go down the property line, but if I'm that hot, high above my neighbor, I can get it there, but it's going so fast, it goes right inside of their house. It never stops to take that real gentle swale going the other way. And, and that's that's a you're creating a nuisance for your neighbor in, in conditions like that. And I don't think. I mean, I'd be the last one to tell you that everybody that wants to build a new house has to come to the Planning Commission, but if we're talking four or five, and if the community feels strong enough about it that they want them reviewed, then that would be one possibility, at which point we would have to have some standards. But we're talking about every other month we'd have to look at a new house. That's, that's a big step, but since we're mo mainly remodels and rebuilds, would that solve the problem? I don't know. And there's certainly the other issue is impervious. Anybody can take and add impervious onto wherever they want right now. And what would be a reasonable standard? That's a hard one again. Dale, your, your houses were probably wouldn't match that. And 30% is what we use for commercial. Are we happy with that for residential? Or some of those super lots, I sure don't want to see 70% impervious, but some of the substandard lots would be pretty hard to hit it and, and to not have less than that. And, and there are, you can put permeable pavers, permeable pavements, there's different ways you can address that. And this is mainly, the ones that you researched that you found in different municipalities is really new. This is something that's come fairly recently in most municipalities, last 10 years I'd say. And the county started it, maybe didn't start it, but they really jumped on with the shoreline zoning ordinance where they're trying to stop runoff directly into the lakes. And that's where a lot of it came about. Do we want to do that, Monona? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but that'd be totally separate than a lot of these building issues. Do we care as much about commercial as we do residential? Do we care about commercial development? Is the question. Well, our standard's been there for aesthetics more than <coughs> water quality, but it certainly hits both of them when you do that. But the, the, all the ordinances in place right now have been very hesitant to take all the water quality standards and attach them to residential. Since we started on that end, um, let's just go around the horn. Rob, comments from you, and then we'll just run down. Well, I think having restrictions on height, I think we absolutely should have. Um, I think if they're causing issues for their neighbor, I think that should, you know, maybe it should be reviewed, but I think there should be restrictions on height. I don't want my neighbor building their 45-foot tall architectural masterpiece that they think is great, and it, there has to be a restriction, I think. I think that's important. Um, the lot coverage, what the magic number is there, I think there's some merit having some guidelines and or restrictions on how much you should be able to pave. I mean, we want to <coughs> protect our, 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 our storm water and where that's going and going into the lake, and I think having some sort of benchmark to meet is something to shoot for. Um, as far as the review process or how that should go if it's if it's five you know and if we review every every new construction property it's a possibility I guess I, I would be okay with it but I don't know if that's fair to new builders um, if any other municipalities have any sort of requirements like that right I like so um, <laughs> when I look at some of the simple suggestions and the comments that go along with it, uh, the height definition, that goes into the grading aspect for me. So the where the, the height is determined from, to me, matters about the, it's tied directly to the grading piece. So if it um, goes the path of no review by this board, I would want those to be more tied together, more tied to the, the permit itself. If it did come here, I would also want those tied together. 
and the definition of particularly where the measurement comes from. The uh, pervious and impervious surface I would like to see us have a guideline regarding the percentage. Um, and if it was going down the path of review by this group, that, that would be one of the elements that would be reviewed, uh, much like we've done with some of the commercial sites when it, it, make, it makes sense given the, the lot um, that they didn't meet the goal. We had reasoning behind it and we looked at what the impacts were on stormwater and how that was being addressed and cleaned and, and, and done. And as Kathy pointed out, there are a variety of ways that that can be maintained. But I like the idea of shooting for um, some sort of a standard with that. And then the grading I addressed. When we get to the complicated, um, the first one, no. Uh, so I don't like the idea of. Um, looking for a cookie cutter Truman Show. Um, the second bullet about the architectural review board, I agree that I think it would just be too challenging to do at this level and doesn't make sense and it would reinforce number one. The third one um, for neighborhood associations, that's a purely voluntary basis um, initially to get that going and I would leave that up to individual neighborhoods to determine if they wanted to um, go into that title restriction. And then the last one, I don't even know if I understand it completely about the floor area ro ratio and the landscape surface ratio. I think it's beyond uh, the scope of this. Yeah. Um, my initial thought, particularly in the impervious cover, I, I, I think so many of the regulations and ordinances we're talking about for single family development evolve for new developments and new neighborhoods, right? So where someone's purchased 10 acres in a cornfield and they're establishing regulations for that, they can say things like 40% <coughs> for the home and 60% for the impervious cover. But in Monona, we can't take a lot over on McKenna and then give, put the same regulations there as, or I should say we have regulations for that. We can't apply those. Uh, and a lot over on Gordon Avenue that's 50 feet wide and 70 feet deep um, because they wouldn't even be able to put a house on there if they could only put it on 40 percent of the property, right? So yeah, in an older neighborhood like this with the, the diverse character, I think it's virtually impossible to blanket the community with single family home regulations. So, and, and maybe that means that the only solution is what Chris is talking about in that new construction single family comes by planning commission. Now the project on some right gets compared and that's really irrelevant on all levels because it was a PMP, right? So it doesn't apply. I mean no one came and, and, and asked to put a house on a 35 foot lot. Mm -hmm. and so that just doesn't even apply there. So you're really so you are talking about teardowns and rebuilds. And, and I would be shocked if that was five a year. I'd be shocked if it was four a year. So right. maybe that's the easiest solution. So. Um, but I like the idea of some kind of control of raising the grade prior to construction. Come, it can maybe coming by the plant commission if you're going to raise the grade on it. I use word that, but you're going to raise the grade more than a certain number of feet or a certain amount that it needs to come here, but you need to explain why you want to do that. Uh, if it's because of drainage, maybe we'd allow that. I, I mean, there, and it should be connected to the total height. 35 feet seems to be pretty typical in all these communities. Mm -hmm. uh, from the mean grade, if we want to say mean grade, but then the mean grade gets shifted if you're going to build up the grade to start with. So I think that's why I think there, I think there should be some control over that. Um, I also like the idea of 65% for impervious service. That also seems to be the most common number. I'm just thinking this is the most common number. And once again, if people were going to exceed that, then they would be required to come to the Planning Commission and explain why that was necessary. And if you're going to build this 
three card arrived with one huge so you can put your boat in so that I can come explain it and show what it's, what it's going to look like because most likely it is going to be the entire front yard. street front is just going to be cement and do we want that? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's those, that's the kind of thing that I'm hearing is upsetting to people um, because it does change the look of the neighborhood and, you know, as I look down the longer part of Tony Wather, for example, I suspect we are going to see this happening more often um, as those older houses come down. Um, we may see a wall of house at some point in cement, and I don't know that we want that. I mean, it's, I don't want to discourage people either, but I think it, and I, I think when you get an architectural style, that is real problematic, and you know, everybody's got different tastes. That's fine. But I think the grading is an issue with the total height and then the imperfect surface. It does to me seem like the things we should be able to get at. Um, with, with the understanding that maybe somebody can make a good case before this commission and we would um, you know, offer a, a little bit more imperfect surface. I don't know. I mean, that makes sense. Great. Well, I'm against the, the complicated solutions. I just don't think we're ready to go to architectural standards or neighborhood associations other than what we already have. Uh, I'm in favor of the height definition. I agree that it seems to me there ought to be some way to, to regulate the grading and the change of grade above a certain level uh, should require some kind of a review or permit. Uh, and I, I, I think I agree that uh, we could ap apply uh, an impervious surface limitation and, uh, and let anybody who wanted to exceed it come to the commission. There certainly are circumstances that would allow for a variance, but, uh, but maybe it's that the easiest way is to establish a standard and permit them to come here to explain why they would want a variance. And with, um, so what I heard was um, the suggestions were for, yeah, sorry, Cast. Well, my question is, when we talk about the issue of impervious as an example, are we doing it for aesthetic purposes or are we doing it for water purposes? And so if that's the case, supposing you put underground drainage in and, to de I mean, do you have an option? If you're going to exceed what is our guideline, supposing you have a way of dealing with the runoff from the impervious that doesn't drive it onto an underground source, like my house. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no runoff from my, my house whatsoever because it all goes down. I have a big pipe in the middle of my kitchen and it all, all the water from the, and supposing you built the house and you did that. So do we care about, so when we're looking for issues here, is it is it a problem that we're trying to prevent or is it aesthetic? Because I think we need to be clear on that and then I think we need to say, okay, you can do this, but the, but the real issue is controlling the runoff, not, not the amount of impervious. That I would say both. So, for example, although the, the homes on thumb right are slightly different, um, but because there is um, more impervious surface, the amount of landscaping that is increased in that property helps with the aesthetics greatly. So I think there are both components of it, some water quality issues, but also aesthetics with that. Because if that same property had not the level of landscaping and intensity of it, I think the aesthetics would be awful. Although the water quality, but I'd like to hear what others. If these, if, if, if these were not uh, built into the ordinance, but if these were also guidelines, and what was in the ordinance was that if there is a teardown, uh, if you're going to be changing the, uh, uh, the, the grade or whatever, that it comes here. So that, again, these are guidelines, but, but that I'm hearing people are like the idea of. Um, some sort of a review in this body would make sense and that the guidelines we would have would be for height impervious surface um, any changes to the elevation um, this idea of the new Berlin guidelines I we haven't seen it but you know that might be something um, 
uh, that uh, so the, the ordinance would say that they would come back here and then there would be guidelines that um, individuals could have uh, for the presentation of this body Sonia? Uh, just taking some notes on the comments as the comments went through. Um, me, Sonia, yes. Before you do that, I just want to insert one thing that speaks to Kathy's question, and, and I, I really believe this, is that as complaints come in or concerns come in, they will be masked as the concern being water quality. The reason they came in to complain is aesthetics. All right. So if well, some oh, if something looks good and the, and, it, and and this definitely isn't right, but if something looks cool, nobody talks about it. Nobody cares where the water. Well, that's subjective. We can't say that if someone comes in and with water quality concerns, why are we to say that's under a guise of aesthetics? Um, personal experience. Ex personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's good. That was the purpose of some of the questions that I posed as like helping us to define the issue because I think in a lot of cases it is both. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get to explain what the floor area ratio and landscape surface ratio is. I'm not advocating for it. I think it would be very difficult and impossible, not even, it would be beyond the scope because we're talking about four or less houses. Um, so it's just not appropriate. But what that does is it compares the ratio of the building on the lot to the area of the lot. So it addresses the proportionality and would be a, um, different for these different situations that we're talking about. And it also combines, I think, the aesthetic. It addresses the intensity, the bulk, the mass of the structure. And then when you combine it with the impervious surface limitation and the building envelope, those things would all work together. Oh, you're making it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, I think, that is a tool that exists to address these types of issues. I don't even know how common it is to apply to residential. It's, it's more common in commercial areas. Um, Again, you're just addressing single family, mm -hmm. basically existing single family lots. I had a few more comments, but did you have some? Well, I think regardless of whether most people complain because of the aesthetics, I think it's our job to be responsible about the water quality. Oh, so, absolutely. So I think, I, I, I guess I don't think that matters so much. And I think the, I think we should be looking at the impervious surface because, because of concern about water quality um, as well as aesthetics. And I think aesthetics are part of it. I just think it's harder to get at that in a residential situation. I don't know. And, and then, you know, if we say they're going to come to us, then what are the guidelines by which we decide, okay, well, if this house do it or not this one? I mean, I, it is a, it's a sticky surface. Yeah, it's hard to get on that road, too. Yeah. But doesn't the city already when we talk about impervious, we have some kind of mechanism because when they when they assess for the um, stormwater utility and for the stormwater um, fund, they base it on the amount they we've got these overheads where they have pictures of how much impervious you have on your property, and we have a way already to rate or grade that, and we have a way to make exceptions whether or not you're creating runoff. So we do have the ability to understand standards on a lot-by-lot -lot basis in this community in terms of water quality runoff, I believe. Is that not? We do have the stormwater um, impervious surface fee that should act either as a deterrent. I don't know how high the fees are, if people uh, consider that a deterrent or not, but it's based on the amount of but, but so when we talk about impervious and how much you allow, I mean, in, in again, back to our house, because our we don't contribute to the stormwater runoff because our, our water doesn't run into the street. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. I mean, so we have the ability to, to make some distinctions on individual lots for the what we're doing to the water quality. Other comments? What direct, how do we want to, Sonia, go ahead. <laughs> I had a few more in implementing these things. I think um, if, if, the, if we were going to have planned commission review all new homes, um, we would have to define what new home construction meant. A lot of people will want to leave the foundation or leave one foundation wall, so we'd have to define um, if it's a complete tear out of the previous home. Um, or they'll get around the rules by, by including the existing in. Well, if they, if they leave the foundation and the 35-foot um, issue, we're not going to be concerned about them raising the grade. 
but if they impact the grade, they would want it to come here. Yes, and it depends on uh, the limit that you, how you define the foundation, because they could leave the foundation wall that is at the lower end of the slope towards the lake, but raise up the rest of the property. Um, and then I just had two more quickly, is um, if we, we've been talking about, well, there are two standards, the grading and the impervious surface, and we could have a, a minimum standard for that, and if they wanted to go above that, they would come to plan commission. And I'm not sure exactly how that would work and why we would pick out just those two standards as coming to plan commission, where every other variance in a single family district goes to ZBA. So just thinking through that, why we would pick out just those two things. You're not making this any easier, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to decide this tonight? Chris? I'm not, I didn't raise my hand to answer your question. Uh, okay, impervious is really easy. Uh, if we decide if it's a general consensus, we should have a standard for it. And we have a standard, and if they want, they want to exceed that, they have to come to plan commission. They would have to that, go to the CBA. If, unless we, if right. plan commission creates the standard, and Planning Commission has the authority to um, make exceptions. It could be when you craft that standard if we're crafting it from here. And the reason I say that, remember, it's, it's a tougher one at, at ZBA. That's what the consensus is, and it's a tougher one at ZBA. But that one's easy, because if we say it's 65 or 70 percent maximum pervious, and if you want to exceed that, you better come get permission. If you don't, build away. It seems to me the other problem is just great. So whether it's new or remodel, if they're not changing, if they're not effectively changing the grade, and that's a fairly easy thing for the building inspector to see. If, if they are changing it very much, go to Planning Commission. If you want to change it? If you want to change the character of that, go to Planning Commission. Now, the, the size of the building and the aesthetics, I, I don't believe we should be here to regulate mm -hmm. the aesthetics. I, I, it's just too hard. And, and if people want to put together a homeowners association, more power to them. We put them together for them in our subdivisions when we build them. We give them money to start a homeowners association. We can't get them to stay up and keep doing it because it's just a pain. And neighbors eventually don't like to tell their neighbors what to do unless it's affecting them. The only people we ever get to volunteer are the people that want to change something. Now, Frostwoods has been very successful. They've got a really unique, great neighborhood there. But I'd be shocked if the neighborhood associations around here, they would create themselves strong enough to say, we want this type of architecture. I'm not sure they should. But but the thing, if those are the two things that are bothering us, it would be that hard to craft something that says, you know, if you exceed this standard, you come to Planning Commission. And should you check with Bill too? You know, should it go to ZBA or here? And if the intent, if the intent is that this body wants to review it, do we have to call these guidelines, or are they built into the ordinance? Yeah, I think if more I, I the guidelines, if, if that, we that's have what I'm authority saying, to enforce it, built into the ordinance, then it would go to me. It would go to ZBA, but like Bill Cole, it would depend on how he crafted that ordinance. But yeah, I mean. It, have build structure it so that it comes back here. And, and what you said, it, it's um, uh, impervious surface and grade. Are the a lot of communities are starting to require grades to come back for review because we're not the only one that has this issue. And neighbors are just forgetting about their neighbors and dumping water and creating problems. And people are just sick of trying to enforce it. So there are a lot of communities that are starting to look at grades on, on residential, single family residential, which they never used to do. It was hands off. If you could talk to Bill and maybe come back with some feedback for us for mm -hmm. our next go around on this. Any other comments on this topic before we move on to the exciting world of Airbnb? <laughs> I mean, we have gone, I'll tell you, we have gone from single family to earth station dish antennas. <laughs> and we're going to end the night on short term rental vacation rental by owner Airbnb. <laughs> Sonia. Uh, this came up last Monday. <clears throat> um, just a casual question at City Council about the city, how the city currently addresses short-term rentals. Um, how I have interpreted it since I've been here is that short-term rentals are prohibited in single-family districts, and that interpretation I've explained in the code um, is based on the fact that a short-term rental is not consistent with the single-family um, character of the neighborhood. Uh, it's not that it's because it needs to be owner-occupied or renter-occupied. We do allow people to rent their properties, and we have occupancy limitations um, for properties that are renter-occupied, etc. 
um, who I've listed that the um, definition that I've pulled together for what a short-term rental is, is based on um, the definition of transient, which comes from both the state statutes and our room tax ordinance. So it's kind of buried in a different section of the code of ordinances. It's not directly in our single family um, district definitions, but transient is defined as a person residing for a continuous period of less than 30 consecutive days in a hotel, motel, or other furnished accommodations available to the public. And then I've listed zoning issues with short-term rentals and why um, they typically are prohibited. And it's um, things like zoning protects your property by limiting what your neighbor can do on theirs. And a buyer has some confidence when they purchase a single family home in a single family zoning district, knowing that they're not gonna be living next to a hotel or a commercial business with transient rentals overturning um, every weekend or every week. And some of the concerns that come with those things are um, possible nuisances like additional noise, traffic, cars. Um, in rural areas, there are concerns about how many people are packing into these homes and overloading septic systems um, might be similar concerns for municipal infrastructure um, and other things that you may or may not have read when you got the packet. So um, that's kind of my interpretation of it. And it's sort of just for information. Um, you can agree or disagree with my interpretation. Um, and if you want to clarify the uh, code in any way. Comments, thank you, Sonia. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is they're prohibited, correct? Yes. Yeah, I think. Who's going to enforce this? Because we already have, I mean, I know of several places in the city where we have mother-in-laws rented in single family residential. For under 30 days at a time? What? Well, this deals with under- I understand it, but we don't enforce what we already have. Oh. My concern is if well, you somebody when somebody complains with anything, if there's a complaint, there is there is something uh, that the city has that they can use to enforce it. If, if nobody complains, and it's and and it's the building inspector in this particular. The building inspector does code enforcement. Okay. Any other? Conversation or request on this issue. Thank so you so much. Any precedents from other communities where this has become an issue? Uh, it's a hot topic in planning and zoning, um, and I don't. I'm familiar with Walworth County has a very proactive approach to regulating them um, because our former public works project manager is the deputy planning director there. So I know that she is actively under the direction of the county board, um, looking out, seeking out these. Um, short-term rentals and issuing up cease and desist orders, and it's a lot of staff time. Uh, I know that she has 76 lawsuits um, pending right now. <laughs> um, so it is a hot topic because people um, start doing this type of thing and they're making a lot of income off of it. That's in a tourist area. It, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is it just like a hotel without having to be a hotel, or what is it? Yeah, they're not paying. Uh, hotel tax or tax. Um, yeah, so I guess if anyone's not familiar with Airbnb, it's a lot of people um, use it because it's cheaper than staying at a hotel. Um, they can enjoy the luxuries of a whole single family home, perhaps on the water, they can bring their dogs and have a fenced in yard. They can have more people, it's cheaper for vacationers. So that's the attractiveness um, from the consumer perspective. But then all of these zoning issues and uh, circumventing the tax regulation issues, protection of single family neighborhoods are from the other side. We can choose to allow them if you would like. <laughs> Further comments? Sonia, thank you. Move on to seven reports of staff and commission members. Staff report regarding staff development project proposals. Sonia. I don't have any new applications. So it looks like we won't have an August 22nd meeting. And what about for the 12th? Too far out in advance? 
Yeah, too far to call. Okay, so it looks like nothing on the 22nd. Uh, 7B, request for information, concerns? Seeing none, we'll move on to 8. Move adjourned. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.